Yeah, normally I introduce the speakers, so I guess you could do the weird thing. For those that don't know me, I'm Bob Muller. I'm one of the founders of the Royal Oak Nature Society. We've been um, running programs like this in the nature parks and speakers programs for the last 16 years. Um, a little bit about this program. It started, well, we'll go, there's actually looking at the map. The red is the boundary of the city of Royal Oak. The black is the boundary of Royal Oak Township. Uh, the blue is obviously the river system that used to be here that is completely gone. Now, that slide is because when we started this talk 16 years ago, I'm a fish expert. I study non-game native fish. I wanted to give a talk on the fish that used to live in Royal Oak since we used to have a river. So about half the talk was on the fish and about half the talk was on where the river was. And a lot of people showed up like this, a lot more than we normally get. And we realized that we weren't just drawing nature people, we were drawing history people also. So the talk, is, as well as we found so much data, that if I had a talk that was half fish and half red run and where it was, um, you guys would be here till the sun came up. So it's gone back into really the geology and so forth of why things are here. Um, red Run, you'll oftentimes hear it called or you'll see signs like these that say Red Run Creek. You'll notice Pine Run Creek, Birch Run Creek, Brent Run Creek. When I first started giving this talk, two of those signs up on I-75 didn't have creek on the end. By the way, the creek is the mistake. A run is a creek or a brook or a stream. So you could have, you know, Brent Stream, Brent Creek, Brent Run. If you're in Vermont, you might have Brent Kill, okay? So this is grammatically like saying Brent Stream Creek. <coughs> and the highway department had it three quarters right, but since then they've decided that they should be grammatically wrong all the time and flipped it around. Um, there are thousands of creeks in Michigan, only about 15 are called Run. Most of them are between Saginaw and Monroe. Um, I think most people are familiar with Birch Run, you know, you might go up there shopping. Um, Willow Run. Uh, and even we toured the Ypsilanti sewage treatment plant a while back and the guy referred to our overflow is Willow Run Creek. So nobody seems to have this right anymore. Uh, Rattle, Run. Rattle Run is another one, yes, yes. There's two or three in the Upper Peninsula. Um, and it was named very early, so it may just be that the uh, surveyor that put a name down came from the mid-Atlantic states because that's where the New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland area is where run is the common thing. In the Civil War, there was the Battle of Bull Run. It was a creek that flowed through the area where they had their fight. So Red Run is the proper name. The first thing we started doing, I knew there'd been a river system here because my father told me about it when I was growing up and he remembered it. Um, and I spent 30 years as a scoutmaster, and I was real familiar with topographical maps, so I got one out. And those arrows point to lines that show where there's depressions in a river used to be. It might not be there now, but that map still shows the sort of valley or the groove in the earth that the river made. And that sort of helps a little bit, but all of a sudden there's you know, a significant amount of data on this topographical map that was made maybe 60, 70 years ago. Uh, so I started looking at those, and then I started driving the streets of Royal Oak to see, can I see anything? I knew that Vincetta was the main riverbed, because again, my father had told me that. So what can you still see? Uh, we also looked at older maps, 1872 survey map, and it's got a lot of it on there. Regularly on the old maps, we'll find that the, they skip parts of the river. They'll have the main, or they'll have the main pieces gone, or certain tributaries not there. Um, when these guys made the map, the important thing was where the property lines were because you were gonna buy some land. And it might have been good to know the creek went through your land. Uh, the other thing is our whole area is surveyed in those nice mile squares, which is why the roads are all a mile apart, the main roads. Regularly on the old maps, I'll look at something and I'll go, wow, that's, that's right, except it's like a mile south of where it should be or a mile north. And I've talked to surveyors what well, was real easy when you're working on this checkerboard to have put the data in one mile south or one mile north or that type of thing. So you have to look at it and then maybe look at the land and go, it made sense, but it's here, not where the guy said it was. 
And we got some really old maps. Uh, we got this one and they said it was an 1822 map, except um, it's got the railroad on it, which didn't come in until 1838. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. And uh, then what we realized is somebody had taken the original surveyor's map and they'd added data. Chances are the guy that put the data on this was selling real estate. He was sending this map to guys back in New York who were thinking of buying some land and coming here to farm and they're going to buy it sight unseen. So this thing talks about all kinds of things. In the middle there you can see it says marsh. Down below it's small tamaracks, cranberries, beaver dam. A lot of information. 1840 I probably wouldn't have bought right there because I, maybe I didn't want it real wet. So he's at least telling me that. Various other parts of the map told you what kind of trees were growing there. And this is also where one of those mistakes are, that line there that says oak opening. An oak opening is effectively not in a marsh, it's dry land with oak trees on it and grass. Anybody ever drive down Lincoln and go over the hill in Huntington Woods? That's the oak opening. That map was showing it just south of 10 mile. It's just south of 11 mile. So the guy there made an error and I knew the land enough to immediately go, wow, that's, yes, there is one, but it's just up a little bit. Uh, that's sort of the blue is uh, Red Run. The greenish blue above that is parts of Red Run that are still above ground. Big Beaver Creek and Plum Brook Creek up in Troy go into Red Run just before it hits the Clinton River. The dark blue line at the top of the map is the Clinton, goes through Rochester, goes through Utica, comes out around Mount Clinton, and the red to the one side is the Rouge River. Now, okay, great, water runs downhill. So where these rivers can be depends on the lay of the land. And Michigan, all of the shape of our land happened 10,000, 13,000, 14,000 years ago when the Ice Age was here. Um, Michigan is, by the way, the only state out of all 50 states that 100% of our state was covered by ice. Even parts of Alaska, Minnesota, Wisconsin didn't have complete coverage. Um, and the ice didn't just come down as this wall even ice flows downhill. So you had a Lake Michigan lobe and you had a Lake Erie, Lake Huron lobe because it was already a depression there. And that ice is sort of sliding downhill and then it would melt back. And then it would come back again and then it would melt back. And this happened many times. And every time a lobe came down, it created a moraine, which is, if you could think about it, it's like the dirt in front of a bulldozer. It's the hill that got left behind. So, as the ice went back, Lake Erie was a whole lot bigger than it is today. And in fact, every single inch of Royal Oak was under Lake Maumee, and parts of it were under four or five other lakes. So we're living on the bottom of a lake. And all of Detroit and this area, clear over almost to Ypsilanti, is the old lake plain of the predecessor of Lake Erie that was a whole lot bigger. There's an aerial photograph. They leave Canada out, so it gets a little confusing, but you can see that big valley goes clear down into Ohio. Uh, if, you, if you were in downtown Birmingham, you were out of Lake Maumee, and if you started driving south on, lake, on I-75, you wouldn't come out of the other side till you got to Lima, Ohio. So the lake was a little bigger than it is today, and that's why we talk about Ohio being flat. As soon as you get south of Lima, Ohio, it's not flat, it's rolling land. It's flat where it was the bottom of a lake. And this is uh, a cut when they tore out a basement wall in the winter in Royal Oak, which is right on the beach ridge. And you can see those millimeter at a time layers of sand that the wave action put down. Put it down 13,000 years ago and you can still see it. This was uh, on South Altadena between uh, Fifth and Lincoln. Sixth and? Sixth and Lincoln, thank you. Um, all of those black lines are different beach ridges that were in the city. And you can see the blue lines. And there was something called the Detroit Moraine that uh, you can sort of see the line coming down like this from the black lines. It was higher and it went under the lake so it flattened out. But on the one side of it, the Rouge River drains and on the north side of it, the Clinton River drains. So again, water runs downhill. So you gotta have some kind of a ridge between either different tributaries or different systems. Now there's a, a shot of Royal Oak itself. The blue is the whole river system we had. The green lines are various beach ridges. Um, 
the one to the far left, good, is um, Lake Whittlesea. Well, you can see the names, Little, Little, Whittlesea, Arcona, Warren, Lake Wayne, Lake Grasmere. Um, all of these made little ridges in our land. We think of Royal Oak as flat, but from 14 in Woodward to 696 and I-75, the city drops 110 feet in elevation. And every time it came to one of those beach ridges, they're the, really the little sand dunes on the edge of the lake. It raises up a little, and then it drops down into the lake, and it drops down until it got to the lower next lake as the lakes became lower, eventually being the level that Lake Erie is today. Um, you have to find a way to break through those ridges. So a lot of the tributaries are running sort of north and south. Uh, so the next slide, it's hard to remember. One of the neat things is, I just realized a week ago, this talk was changing up to three days ago, because there were things that um, I was given that all of a sudden I went, oh, I hadn't seen that before. Uh, this is part of the Rouge River, but the last five years I've spent thousands of hours um, in waders in the Rouge River sampling fish. So I really understand a real river system and the little creeks and the main branches and what happens. And you notice all those streams coming down from the um, left side. And that road there where there's uh, the line going up and down is Ridge Road. It's on the Whittlesea Beach Ridge. And all those creeks came down and couldn't get over the hill. So almost like the spine of a comb, they're running along the ridge until they found a spot to break through. And in that particular place, none of those creeks are any more than a foot deep. And when they come together and break across Bridge Road, you could canoe. So it's 10 little creeks that come together all at once. And a huge amount more water is there. And right there in Royal Oak, up near Pioneer Park on Woodward, you see the exact same thing, except it's gone. You've got to look at old maps and see the little bits and pieces that it existed. Um, the corner there with the circles and the lines, those are two beach ridges, and all the circles were springs in 1872. Uh, on the downstream or downhill side of one of those beach ridges, you had a lot of water just percolating out of the earth. So the wettest spot in Royal Oak was up where Cummingston Park is, a little cross-hatched rectangle in the bottom. My laser light pen failed, so it would have been nice to have that today. So that gets through a lot of the physical thing and the the geology and the geography and the topography of wh why the water was where it was and what happened. Now it comes down to, you know, what do we know about this river? Because most of it went away anywhere from 1920 to mid-60s. Um, and there aren't many photos. We've had a hard time finding them, and a lot of times they don't identify anything on the photo. Um, nobody cared about taking a picture of the old Crummy Creek. They wanted to take a picture of the new train station the new school. That was the thing to get copies of. And in the Historical Museum, we got lots of photos of all the schools and the train stations and so forth. But that's it. We got four shots out of different books that we were able to find. And from the captions on some of these, you know, Red Run uh, Creek flowed through Royal Oak. Well, that tells me where it's at, doesn't it? You know, and the bottom one, uh, oh, Red Creek, uh, circa whatever it is, 1920. Um, don't know. I bet that house isn't still there. It's not going to help me. You know, Old Red Run Drain and the Wooden Bridges, 1910. The, the one in the far corner, though, we got some photos this year and we identified that. So we'll show you that later in exactly where it is. But that's it. You know, hundreds of photos of the building of Royal Oak, but not the creek. Uh, another one, uh, the young lady on the left side uh, grows up to uh, marry one of the hill singers. So one of the old historic families in the city. Um, and again, in the caption on the photo, gave the names of the two young ladies. They really weren't taking a picture of the river. It just happened to be behind the girls that somebody was taking a photo of. That was all we had. A few aerial photos. Uh, the one corner there where the arrow was pointing is Vincetta. The streets are going in. The creek is flowing down the middle still. There's a, another map. There's a 12 Mile in Woodward, and that's Vincetta. You've still got water going down the middle, and the street's going in. Not sure the timing, except the railroad isn't where it is today, which was 1930. And I'm presuming for aerial photos, this was after World War I because you had a lot of airplanes. So you're 1915 to 1930, these photos were taken. Another shot, this one is probably a real estate developer. That's Northwood Boulevard and 12 Mile, and that's Red Run and Vincetta Boulevard up at the top. 
Um, wow, neat photograph. No real good explanation, but you know, nobody drove a car out of this. They had to drag that car down there for the photo. They were having fun. And again, not a lot of explanation. That photo's in all the records, but nothing that even tells you everything. Like, who were the guys in it? What are they doing? What's the exact year? This is Red Run today in Macomb County. All of it in Oakland County is buried. And these shots were either on Van Dyke, Ryan, or Mound. I don't remember which, but, and it's been ditched tremendously. Back in the 1950s, they started really ditching it down because it was a drain. Um, up until 1972 with the Clean Water Act, all our toilets flushed untreated into rivers. And I remember the main red run, which was uncovered to Campbell Road when I was a kid, and my mother would always say, don't you ever play down there, there's rats down there. And even as a grade school kid, from my nose, why the heck would have I ever gone down there? Because it, it wasn't, there was even a plant over on Campbell Road that made, uh, was it, get the wrong, melagolite? Melagonite, yeah, which is a fertilizer made from human waste. Well, it was a good place, right? We were all flushing our toilets into the river. Somebody was scooping it out and selling it back to us. It's a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is uh, Paint Creek in Rochester. This is probably about what it looked like before somebody started ditching it. It would have been big enough to take a canoe down the main branch. Um, very few people remembered much about it. And there's the main branch through Royal Oak, coming up out of Huntington Woods and Oak Park and exiting and it eventually hits uh, the Clinton River. Jeez, I can't even remember where. It's quite a ways up. Utica. Quite a ways up. Utica, it's up near Utica, isn't it? Metropolitan Parkway. Yeah. Again, there's those uh, same ridges coming down, and you can see the Clinton coming off to the north and the Rouge to the south. But the really, and there's Big Marsh. Now again, 1822, 1838, that marsh is going north of 11 mile, south of seven mile. It's running from about Coolidge to not too far off of, uh, uh, be Wyoming probably or so, or L Livernois down there. Um, Royal Oak is sitting where it is today because it's a day's travel out of Detroit. It makes sense it should be at the corner of 11 mile and Woodward, except 11 mile and Woodward was a cranberry bog. Not a great place to build a town. We've drained it since. It's okay to have a building up there now. Uh, one of those beach ridges ran right up Main Street. In fact, the town south of us is named after it, Pleasant Ridge. It, uh, Rochester Road is on the angle because the beach ridge is on that angle. Because if not, all the roads should be in that nice square grid pattern that the surveyors put on. Uh, so when, when they developed the city here and the railroad came through, they came about a mile off Woodward on 11 Mile started the city. Now there's a shot of that marsh. And the really thing I found really interesting, especially after spending five years jumping in the Rouge River, is two river systems came out of it. The north side of that marsh has streams that flowed into the Clinton and the south side of the marsh had streams that flowed into the Rouge River. I thought that was really neat. Uh, that kind of stuff was a lot more common before we drained the world because there were a lot of places where in the spring and high water, rivers connected. And we don't see too much of that anymore. Now, the other neat thing is we're, we're sitting, I should have called this uh, talk connections because it's amazing how many things keep bumping into other things. Um, we're standing or we're sitting in what was Dondero High School in the Dondero Auditorium. And uh, in fact, George A. Dondero attended my high school graduation from here. And that was uh, his family farm. That was from Scotia to Wyoming, from nine mile to eight mile. And the thing I thought that was really strange is, what the heck, was it the last piece of property on earth? You bought 320 acres and most of it was a marsh? Doesn't seem like a really good place to farm. And we got talking a little bit about this. There's a shot from 1921, the Antonio Dondero subdivision. He was one of the grandsons or sons of the original that became a real estate guy. So he, he was basically subdivided his father's farm. A couple guys owned it, but you can see a couple creeks coming out of it. One out of this, one goes right up Scotia. One is, uh, you see the little dotted line to the side. And it does say, it's hard to see, that they're starting to dig a ditch right up the middle. So they're starting at least at this point when they're subdividing it to try to drain it so that somebody might want to buy 20 acres and build a house. 
The neat thing is, what Don Darrow's father's business was is he was in the willow trade. Anybody ever heard of the willow trade? I'm looking out there. Okay, how many people remember when the laundry baskets weren't plastic? They were big willow baskets? Okay, well there were willow baskets two, three hundred years ago too, and there were willow baskets until the 1960s. Then the plastic took over. People actually grew willow to weave those baskets. And willow like swamps. And the way you do it is you cut the little trees or shrubs right down to the ground every year, and you get six to 10 foot sprouts that are about a quarter inch in diameter, and you harvest them in the fall, strip the bark off, and you sell them to the people that make baskets. So it made sense. I guess Don Darrow's dad wasn't dumb. He actually knew what he was doing. He was in the willow trade, and what did he do? He bought 320 acres of a marsh. Um, since it's very dry now, I've driven through the area, there's no hint that there was ever a marsh there. So the, the red is, and the neat thing is actually two streams came out of that marsh because they had to go either side of that hill in Huntington Woods. The red one is the one we're talking about right now, but a couple others came out. One came out of the uh, far east side, and another one actually started in the zoo, which are the green ones. But the red one crossed, um, there it is, right about where the beef carver is. You can see the dip in the road. The traffic light up ahead is 11 mile. Uh, if you go drive 11 mile, you can still see all these slight dips in the road. That little rolling isn't that it just was there for no reason. There used to be a river that crossed there. And then it wove around um, on the east side of Woodward and about Iroquois came in and hit Vincetta. And those bridges were real bridges. Water went under them when they built this first street. Uh, I've been told that the city workers hate them because the snow plows don't fit and they get the shovel. Um, not sure if that's true, but it's a good story anyways. And uh, yeah, it's been a while since you could go trout fishing on Red Run, you know. If you've ever driven down to Vincetta, it meanders until it hits 12 mile. And actually it didn't go where Vincetta starts on the other side of 12 mile today because the river was gone. They changed a few things because when they built the railroad, they didn't want to have to build two bridges. So that's why Vincetta does that jog. And there's a little piece of Vincetta that sort of goes down towards the railroad tracks. This is the house on the west side of the tracks and you can see the dip in the yard. And that's where the river continued to flow. Uh, this is Vincetta at about Coolidge. It was a pretty wide floodplain. You can see a pretty darn good sloping hill up to the houses. Um, and a floodplain, you know, it allows your river to spread out when there's high water, slow down the speed, come back in. Uh, we hear a lot about that today. Really bad to build in the floodplain. There are some other shots on Vincetta. And anywhere in the city, if you see a meandering street and you have those kind of angles going up to the houses, it's an old floodplain. Uh, I'm sure people have seen the old windmill on the pond. That was a natural pond. It's been enlarged, but it was a natural pond with a creek that came down Aqua Court that fed through the pond and then flowed out of that into um, Red Run when it crossed, uh, went through Wagner Park. Uh, Wallace Gabler let us get in there with uh, nets a few years ago, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago now. We, I wanted to see what fish might be in there and if they were not the kind of fish people fish for or the kind of bait people use, then I would have been finding fish that had been living in Royal Oak forever. We found nothing, but I was, you know, wanted to give it a try, and Mr. Gabler, when we told him what we wanted to do, says, yeah, jump in my pond. You know, very nice gentleman. Told a great story when he was a little kid, Mr. Gabler isn't with us anymore, but he said, uh, well, he was little, you know, like preschooler, and they're gonna have a picnic, and his mother's taking all the kids down to the river. And he says, and like all kids, you know, they're far in front of mom, right? They're running. And by the time his mother actually got to the river, his older brothers had built a raft, put him on it, and shoved him out in the middle of the river. You know, there's the uh, sort of ravine through Wagner Park. Um, and that is the old riverbed again. When I was a kid, like I said, it, it opened right at uh, 12 Mile and Campbell. Flowed down 12 Mile, cut over through a park that's in Madison Heights now. Um, and you can see that it goes on. It had already been ditched. It was, you know, 30 feet deep and had sides like this. Uh, and like I said, it had a really nice aroma. 
1963, they started to cover it within Royal Oak. So these are some of the shots of when they were digging it out, casting the nice big rectangular concrete pipe underground. And if you were at uh, Stevenson and 12 Mile looking northeast, you could still see these two little buildings that they're showing behind that little restaurant. That was where this flowed out still into an exposed creek. It doesn't anymore. Uh, and there it is. In fact, it sort of shows that I-75 isn't there yet. Nope, they've, yeah, they've covered it, but there's not, by 97 they had covered it all the way to DeQuinder, which is all of Oakland County. And there's two bridges on I-75. There's a bridge where it had to pave, you had to go over the river. Since then there is no river. Well, you didn't tear the bridge out or fill in underneath it. If you're exiting off uh, the exit, coming south on I-75, 12 mile road, if you look to the right, at the right point, you will see this bridge. That's left. You're right. When I turn around though, it's, see that was left, so this must have been right. It's the, it's the one problem with uh, that, thank you. Couldn't let that go, could you? No, no. Okay, today, um, you can't build buildings on top of something where you put that big of a drain under. If for no other reason, if you ever had to work on it, you'd have to tear buildings down to work on it. So, you know, I guess we've, you know, lucked out. We, we got the George W. Kuhn Retention Treatment Basin right there behind uh, Home Depot. Um, it has the ability, when we have one of these big rains, to store over 120 million gallons of sewage instead of dumping it into the river. And then all of our water is pumped to the Detroit sewage treatment plant. So they would then be able to fill this thing up and then pump it out and hopefully not dump in the river. When they do dump in the river, by the way, they use chlorine injectors and they put so much chlorine in that it probably kills any fish that's downstream from there too. But E. coli and the rest of those things are dead but it's still not what you want to do. You want to run the stuff through the sewage treatment plants. You've got Red Oaks uh, Youth Soccer, you've got Red Oaks Golf Course, you've got Red Oaks Water Park, and you've got the Red Oaks <coughs> Dog Park, which actually has a sign that talks about the old Red Run River. So a lot of nice recreational stuff at least went on top of this when they buried it. I would have rather had a trout stream, but that's the main branch, but you had a lot of tributaries. Yes, sir. No, um, you could walk the whole golf course if you played golf, at least you could walk everything there, you know. Um, but yeah, it's all separate entities on the property. But aside from that, there wouldn't be a problem, but I'm sure there's fences in between all those things. Off the main branch, you had creeks like this. They might have been ankle deep, they might have been a foot deep, they might have been 10 foot wide, they might have been three foot wide. So you had a lot of these kind of creeks that fed the system. And I talked a little bit about that one before Pioneer Park. You can see all those little creeks that hit the beach ridge and then flowed down. This one went through Memorial Park, goes down uh, Bonnie View, finally enters Red Run. There's again that shot of a existing same situation. There's what you can see on the old topo map, which really says, yep, it was there. Yeah, this was uh, 1921, they at least showed it crossing Woodward twice. You can uh, see the dip right past 13 Mile and you go over a little hill and you take another dip again where Pioneer Park is. Um, this is on Webster, just west of Woodward, and I'm looking down a street that's called Ravina that doesn't come all the way through. And you can sort of see that dip there. And then I drove around to the other side and I'm looking back. And the interesting thing is that's a big willow tree with about 10 or 12 trunks, which probably means it's a willow that was cut down and sprouted and 10 or 12 trunks were allowed to grow. Um, that's still there from when there was a creek. It's, so we, we use botany a little bit to all of a sudden say, these aren't the kind of trees people normally planted for landscape, but if they're along this route and the map says the river should have been here, we're probably hitting it. Uh, in fact, this is um, Memorial Park, and all those trees are also willows that are growing along the old creek bed. 
Um, this is a shot, uh, Bill Newman. I put the names on these because I could never remember them. One of, these, or one of the early talks, I said, I couldn't figure out where this stream went. And he says, oh, it went down Bonneview. And I said, are you sure? And he says, well, yeah, I stood on the corner of Marywood and Bonneview throwing stones into it in 1930. I said, oh, okay. And he says, and there's a photo in my church. So we took this off the wall in the church and, and where the red arrow is, you can see the streets going in and, or actually the sidewalks because the street got rid of the, the river in this case. And there's the um, stream still flowing down the center. See the water. Now the neat thing is we discovered a lot of photographs this year, so it was rather exciting. But this part, this, you know, there you go, 1927 above and 1915, to the, you know, two winters ago. And 2015, I'm sorry, 1915? Yeah, I don't remember 1915. Um, what I loved in this photo album, there was a whole set of albums given to the Historical Society, but written in this one was years ago, Lloyd Clausen used to catch trout in this old creek. So we probably either had native brook trout in Royal Oak or 1900, which is probably about when Lloyd would have been doing the fishing. He was, I think, the first mayor of Royal Oak or second mayor. Um, yeah, they were starting to stock rainbow trout. So it could have been rainbows, but it could have very well been native brook trout still coming out of, and the water that came out of uh, Pioneer Park with that breaking through that ridge and that higher ground from the rivers that I play with today there's parts of the Rouge River that the water is still not more than 65 degrees in August, and that's enough for trout. So we very well could have had them in the city. So that shot with me with the fly rod and the vest, I might have just had to walk a little further from my house to go trout fishing. I just made the mistake of not being born in 1900. Uh, this fish also, this is a fish that I was studying in the Rouge. It's only found in three creeks in the state. Um, it's called a red side dace. It's only about that big, really pretty fish. Um, but we always were wondering, well, why isn't it in the Huron? Why isn't it in the Clinton? It's found in uh, two rivers in this part of the state and one on the far side of the upper peninsula, really scattered. Um, after hearing the trout lived there and looking at that, we very well may have had this. We'll never know because nobody did any survey work to say what lived here. But since I studied this guy, it was like, now I can at least in my mind go, yeah, we probably had him. You know, there's another shot, same house. Um, yeah, the street with yellow line on it is Bonnie View. I don't know what the cross street is. Woodland, Woodland? okay, so you know the area. A couple more shots, 1927. These were enough in the book that I could tell where they were change just a little. Now, if you drive down Bonneview, first it meanders. Every meandering street in Royal Oak is an old creek bed. Somebody didn't, didn't make this thing like this. They were following the, a creek. There's only two or three of them. Vincetta's one, Bonneview's one. We'll talk about another one later. But again, that floodplain approach, you can see it's going uphill to the houses. In fact, this is one of the few places I can think of where you go up three steps from the sidewalk to get on the sidewalk to go up to the house to go up three more steps. There's a pretty decent hill there. Now, this was the neat thing. This is 1927, and they're getting rid of a whole creek in this city so they can subdivide. Pumping the water out, making it go away, putting it underground. Um, I didn't realize it at first, but you notice the big smokestack on that? That's because that's, that's a real steam shovel. Because these are steam-powered equipment, not diesel. And they had a water tank. That was what threw me at first. They said water tank, and I thought, how much water do you need for radiators in these things? I thought, oh, wait a minute, steam engines, yeah. Okay. That company uh, is still in business. They're, uh, they're out of Phoenix, Arizona now. I contacted them to see if they'd give me more data, but they didn't have anything in their records from that far back. I got a feeling that the guys are playing around for the photographer over here standing. Uh, yeah, never changes. Um, it would sort of go through, I mean, the railroad's there now. It would go through the railroad and go down uh, La Rome Drive and hit Pinsetta. So that's, that one has names in the old history books as the Little Run. It's the only tributary, really, that somebody seemed to have given a good name to. Um, Small Creek, just tiny one. If you know uh, Marias Park on um, Vincetta, 
And that little circle to the one side is, we talked to a, a gentleman who said that there used to be a tiny wetland there. Well, I think this one was the kind of creek that only ran in the spring. When that wetland got really full, it overflowed, and it flowed down that ravine in Murray Park to Vincetta. So it probably was dry in the middle of summer, but it was flowing really good all winter and maybe to June or July. Washington Creek, this one started, if you know where the um, McDonald's is on 14 mile near where Coolidge comes in. This starts sort of behind that in the neighborhoods. And it ran down, went a little bit down uh, Crooks, crossed it about uh, Normandy, cut across the high school campus, went through Tenhave Woods, uh, wandered on a little further, but we'll get some shots. And it's cool because that one doesn't show up on a lot of maps, but this 1816 map shows that one, but it completely misses the main channel. <laughs> but it was one of the few maps where I went, hey, yeah, look, it's that one showing, that's great. Um, this was a 1921 map which showed it. Um, and when you see straight lines like that, they're already turning into a ditch. Somebody's already trying to drain. And you'll notice actually, uh, sort of says Charter Oaks Corporation in the middle. Um, that's where the high school is. Uh, somebody was gonna subdivide that whole area and they failed. And they lost the land in the depression and it came back to the city. So we might have not had the high school where it's at. We might have had a whole neighborhood with little 40-foot lots like everywhere else in the city. Um, there's 1949 aerial photos. We can sort of follow it. The bottom arrow is pointing to the pond in Tenhave Woods. There's the pond today in the spring. There's, it used to be a river that flowed through it. In fact, at the top of Melvin, Bilch, Bleich? Bleak? Bleak, okay. I talked to him about 16 years ago on the phone. He was 90 some odd years old at the time. He grew up in the house that uh, would just be off the slide on this side on um, Lexington. He was a little boy in 1920. Um, he told me, he says, it was a full-time stream that went through the pond. And he said, and then 1920, they buried it south of my house. And the neat thing was, he said, they used horse-drawn earth-moving equipment. So there would have been some trucks in 1920, but you know, there'd probably be a lot of guys still that had horses and that equipment. And this was the neat thing. He said, it flowed behind my house and dropped through a grate into a pipe, like a waterfall. And I knew this culvert was in the arboretum the Nature Society is building for years and somehow didn't connect it until last winter when I was standing out there and all of a sudden was telling the gentleman who was standing there that you can sort of see the dip in the earth where the creek was behind him as I'm almost standing on that thing. And then it was like, wait, this is it. I think when he told me it felt like a waterfall through a grate, I'm thinking modern drains that would have been big six foot square things, not just a small pipe. Um, but so, you know, there's a remnant. Okay, across uh, 12 mile at Glencourt, you can see the, the dip in the road there. And then if between 12 mile and, oh, Royal, or at least the Salvation Army Church, if you drive down any of those east-west streets, you're gonna see dips like this. And you can go to the next street and see where the creek was and the next street and see where it was. And then it flowed down Washington to uh, Vincetta. And you can see again the lawns on that one side, a hill going up. You still had this same kind of thing. We had a house uh, where they wanted to split a lot right in this area. I'm on the zoning board. And the neighbors came over and says, well, you, you can't let them do that. This thing floods every year. And I'm sitting there, you know, yeah, yeah I know it floods every year. It's right where the river was. It was sort of neat. Okay, and this is the one you're talking about. Yeah, um, this one in somewhat modern maps, you could see it called Johnson Creek or I think it was w Williams Creek. I'm, I'm using the Johnson Creek name because Mr. Johnson had a sawmill on this creek in 1825. Could cut 2,000 board foot of lumber a day in the spring, which means the creek was small enough that it took all year to fill a pond up and you cut till the pond went dry. Then you shut your dam down and you waited for the pond to fill up till next spring. But hey, you gotta get a little bit done. Um, hard to imagine water-powered sawmills on a river system in this city. 
There is no river system. It started, uh, yeah, there's just another one of the old maps, one of the topo maps. It's Cummingston Park, one of our nature parks, and Parmeter Drive down below. It's another one of the meandering streets. And there was an old map, sort of showed it curving around and up. And an aerial photo, you could see it on the aerial photo, 1949. Then something really interesting happened. Uh, I was going to the um, rehabilitation, this Beaumont's rehabilitation clinic, and uh, the building up above is the, um, uh, was it, the recycling center. And I parked my car, and as I'm walking, I hear water running. I thought, what the heck? And I walked over, and there's even a sign that says, drain, big red sign. And I, I went back, and I walked back in there, and in that little triangle of land, for like, you know, I don't know, a third of a mile, there's a creek flowing. Comes out from under the fence at the recycling place. It sure can't be where Home Depot is today. There's nothing up there. And then it goes back underground. But it's flowing. There's a little tiny piece of red run that just missed being in Royal Oak because that little triangle of land is in Birmingham or Troy. Um, but we went out two summers ago and decided, hey, we got to look and see if there's any fish or frogs or whatever. And it was like the absolute worst water I've ever been in my life. We didn't even have aquatic bugs. I mean, it was, I don't ever want to walk into something like that again, but we had to try. And where the arrow is to the far side, you can see the little triangle of land. It goes underground at that point again. And it basically was going down Parmeter Drive. When I gave this talk the first time 16 years ago, this guy walked up and he says, yeah, I used to catch minnows in it. And I looked at him because he's my age. And he says, no, 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 no. They buried this in the 1920s. He says, oh, not there. They buried it about 65. I lived on that street and we used to go into Cummingson Woods to catch frogs and toads and we used to go into the creek to catch minnows. So, you know, that was far away from me. I was a little kid. Well, 1965 I wasn't, but say 1960 when I was jumping in the water catching stuff, I was catching it at Gardenia and Campbell Road, you know, uh, 14 and Crooks was too far away. So I find it really annoying because I would have liked to have been catching the fish, but uh, couldn't get up there. Uh, and there's a, a, a shot of it flowing along. It cuts back uh, south of 14 Mile Road, just uh, west of Main Street, and that green is where Mr. Johnson owned his property. So somewhere in there, there has to be a dip in the ground to make a pond. He didn't dig a big hole. And if you start driving down those streets in Clawson, north of Normandy, you can see the dip in the road there. So somewhere along there, they, there was a dam, there was a pond, and there was a sawmill, 1850. It then crosses right about at the park, just around Sunnybrook. Is somewhere in there it crossed Main Street. And then you'll notice down below, it's a little deep. Uh, that's an orchard on the one side. There's a house back off the road. The light marks over here is because in 1952, they're putting the streets in to build houses. That's what's going on, no houses yet. And it's a little hard to see. Maybe the next slide will show it better. Yeah, it's a little closer. Aside from that house, there's sort of a very light white line that goes out to the main street. And there's two little lines up at the top. And that was the guy's driveway. All the houses are there, by the way. So five years later. But what's going on there, and it's still there, is in a backyard. There's still the stone bridge that crossed the creek. Oh my God. And this is just wide enough to get a car over. And this was probably a really smart man because he put his orchard by the road. Main Street would have been a dirt road. A lot of dust. Put his house way back. Much smarter thing. But who would have thought there was a field stone bridge sitting in somebody's backyard in the city? There's a street. Uh, Edmund, thank you. Edmund, um, it's five or six streets north of 13 Mile on Main Street. It's easy to spot because the house on the corner of Edmund and Main does not face either street. It's on a 45 degree angle. If you drive down Edmund, you can look through the backyard of that house and see this bridge. 
When I first saw it, I thought it was a pile of firewood. And then I realized, no, it's a stone bridge. And then I walked around to knock on the door to go take photos, and the house was for sale with a lockbox on the door. So I just went in the backyard and took the photos. One of these days, I have to knock on the door and ask the people, do you know what the bridge is from? Because there's a really good chance the person who lives there isn't in this room, hasn't been to one of my talks, and is probably going, who built this crazy thing in my backyard? You know. Yeah. It, just after Campbell Road, it crossed Campbell. It, it cut through the neighborhood there, crossed Rochester Road, crossed Campbell. And this one runs into where Red Run was, right about across the street from the water park. So that's where that branch met Red Run. Okay, ah, now a tributary on the south. Like I said, two branches came out of that marsh. So the red one we're thinking about now, and it went on the east side of the hill in Huntington Woods, and uh, it crossed Woodward at Lincoln. It went down, it crossed uh, 4th Street at about Pleasant, where the Royal Oak Women's Club is. Uh, if you drive between Maxwell and Woodward, between Catalpa and 11 Mile, there will be a rise and a dip and another rise and a dip. And that's where the two streams were flowing to get up to Red Run. This one, 1921 map still had it showing really good. And it eventually went through Waterworks Park. I, and there's the dip in Waterworks Park. And it's only about two, 300 feet and it's hitting Vincetta. So we had a one there. And the last one, at least of this main part here, is some of these I gave the names to, Johnson Creek, we had, the others were streets in the area because there's no historical references that give us a river name. But uh, Jerome Creek came out of the zoo. There's a lake back near where the bears are. And that lake is a natural water source. The other ones up near where the reptile house are were built. And this creek must have come out of there and you could again see the little dips in the road as it's uh, crossing. It crosses about 11 in Woodward. I would guess that it goes through St. John's Episcopal's parking lot. Now the light blue ones to the side, this had really bothered me because on those topographical maps I could see that there were little tiny creeks south of 12 Mile, east of downtown but nothing significant, no big dip in the road. And I thought, okay, they all had to be just tiny little creeks. It, doesn't, it hasn't left anything you can see. And when we got these old 1905 topo maps, all of a sudden there's all these ditches. And if you got the rest of the maps, this is Bear Creek that goes through the GM Tech Center. Its headwaters came over. There's that big ridge going down Main Street, so really the dark blue is because it's all to the west of that ridge, that light blue is to the east of the ridge. Everything's straight lines, so even by 1905, these had been ditched. They dug them, straightened them to go right down the roads. They still want to get rid of the water. But at least it sort of shows the pattern that came through the neighborhood. And the neat thing is, in fact, there's a, I guess, a little better shot. Uh, the dark line right above Royal Oak is 4th Street. I had to draw that one in. And then that angle, south of 4th Street. That interested me because I live between 4th and Lincoln, right there. It's like, did this run close to me? I know that I got a beach ridge right through my house almost. And one day I'm driving along and I'm driving by Grant Park. And the bottom of those trees are called buttresses. A tree can't put its roots below the water table. There's no air and all plants get all the oxygen from their roots. So if you're in really high water and you're a big tree, you grew your roots this way and you made a big pedestal so you couldn't fall over. If you're in soil that has a low water table, you put your roots down like a carrot. Both methods keep you from falling over. But if you're doing this, you get this big buttress at the bottom because you're reaching out. And I looked at that as I drove by and I lived three blocks away from this for 50 years, you know. And I thought, I'd never noticed it, it didn't hit me before. I thought, 
this must be where that angled creek was. It was a high enough water table that these guys were close to that creek and so they were growing this way. And the neat thing is no more than 100 feet away, you got oak trees like that. Just like a cylinder coming out of the ground. And those two trees are no more than 100 feet apart. So the water table in the soil was radically different in 100 feet for these two trees 100 years ago to be growing. So occasionally, we, again, we use botany to try to get an idea where something may have been that you can't see anymore. Uh, that's the only areas, that's the GM Tech Center there, that's the only areas where Bear Creek's above ground anymore at all. So there's all the river system that was in Royal Oak. And a lot of them got the names I don't like to use. I don't want to call Johnson Creek Lawson Drain, but those were the names, you know, by the time you turned it into a drain. The drain commissioner is in charge of it now, so usually you get to name it after yourself. Now, one more really interesting, cool thing is, again, we're talking history. Uh, the blue lines are the river. You can see Royal Oak there. Uh, those, that red checkerboard are the sections and the surveys. That purplish line is where the big marsh is. The French and the British never by foot explored outside of Detroit. They went up and down the river in boats. There was a swamp. Sometimes you hear it said here that Royal Oak was all a swamp. It wasn't. There were wet areas and there were high ridges. Nobody ever walked inland. It was clear until 1816 that somebody looked. Now they'd already surveyed it and the surveyors reported that the land here was really garbage. So some business guys in Detroit, they were upset about this because they're hoping a lot of settlers come. Because the settlers come, things build, you make money. They decided in 1816 to go take a look. So about seven or eight businessmen took a 12-day hike and they started walking out and we've got the article they wrote that November in the Detroit Gazette explaining what they saw and what the land was like. And they were saying nice things like, you know, uh, if this was in Ohio, this would be first quality farmland or second quality farmland. I don't know exactly what that means, but in this thing, it says about eight miles out of Detroit, we hit a marsh that the headwaters of Red Run comes out of. So in 1816, they already had a name for the river. And these guys, because of carrying those survey maps, knew where they were in the woods because there are no roads at all. This is before any of them. And then he says, they said it, we crossed at about eight, or was it at about 10 miles, we came to a creek of Red Run with good clear water. Well, I expect at this point, they're not walking in the marsh, they're walking up that ridge. And that big black dot, that's where Mary's Creek crosses Woodward at Lincoln. And I think that's the one they came across. And then they said, about four miles further, we hit another branch. Well, I think they didn't talk about every one they came across, but they wanted to talk about that one. And they'd also mentioned that they were in sections 9, 3, 4, and 5, and 6. So there they are, in about four miles above that first dot, you got another branch. You got uh, one Johnson's Creek, almost in the area a sawmill would have been. And then they walked to the west and they camped at Pioneer Park. That's why it's named that on Woodward. And they talked about the branches there being dry at that time of year but they dug about a foot and hit good water. And that's a higher elevation. It's all those little creeks coming across that. And just from what I see on rivers today, yeah, those are the kind of areas that would be dry in the fall. So neat that somebody in 1816 saw this. And I think it's sort of neat that I was able to look at it, look at the city, look at the river that isn't there and sort of figure out where they walked. So that's the story of a river that flowed through this city, an entire river system had trout, had water-powered sawmills, probably would have been great for recreation if uh, it was a century later when everything was developing here, you wouldn't have buried it, but it's gone forever, it can never come back. And when you're driving, look for those dips in the road. Hopefully I talked about something in your neighborhood that you can see, and um, that's the end of the program. So if there's any questions. <laughs>